Hello. 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 Good morning. Good evening. Yep. Good morning and good evening. Yeah, I'm just getting set for the day. And what a beautiful way to start a day for me and a, a, a way to end the day for you. In fact, with Peter, it's always special because as we say, he is a rare breed, a great <laughs> scientist, a wonderful human, a super cool photographer. So today he is going to talk about elk and some awesome photography, their behavior, conservation and science. Yeah. That's the plan for the day. Harry, what do you have to talk about it or what do you have to talk in general? Uh, in general, one thing that uh the eco connectors it's it's going very well like a lot of people from india have planted trees and they are sending uh, us the photos and videos as well some yeah. young kids are also uh involved in a good way yes i and, saw that yeah kids are we need more kids to be a part of this so that's that's something that is good in a way yeah yeah so let's see we we are trying to reach this to maximum people yeah that yeah that is one thing which we are um but which is our new initiative eco connector so this is what you need to do uh, plant a tree and uh, a native tree that is very to be very specific and send us a picture of you planting a tree or uh, a one minute video behind your thoughts on this project that will be great uh, we will be I'll, I'll be personally sharing it on my instagram and then uh, the second thing is we are going to add a page in our website and we will be sharing it over there to along with your name and uh, uh, social media details so please do send it across it's a small way where we all can get involved and do something yeah. good for mother nature basically to connect uh, to create a good community yes and yeah, today let's, I think we we have to call our dear PT. Dearest to, PT. Yes. Yes. Let me add him. Hi, PT. Hey, how are you? Hello, hello. Very good indeed. Very nice to see you guys. And uh, isn't this tree planting wonderful to actually be doing conservation in action? I think that is uh, that is yeah. tremendous, really good. And we also need to add that we're coming up to the next magazine of Paws Trails Aware, yeah. which is yeah. on Indian elephants this time. So if you have some cool photos of Indian elephants doing anything, uh, then please send those in. Please get them uploaded onto our website so we can uh, we can include them in our next magazine, which is, of course, the November edition. Yeah. yeah. And I have also mentioned about uh, this. You know, if you have some vertical, very good shots, then there is a possibility to be the cover shot as well. So it's all about you sharing the best collection from your, uh, you know, from your collection. That will be all about it. I'm sure you all, at least a bunch of you, will definitely have a great collection of Indian elephants. This is all about community photography. This yeah. isn't about individuals and competitions. This is about being inclusive and having the whole community of photographers come together onto a specific subject. Definitely. Yeah. So, PT. It's a, it's all up right now. It's your turn to from elephant to elk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nisha. So today I'm going to talk about the elk rut because in the northern temperate parts of the world, there are two things that coincide at the moment. And these are both wonderful. The first thing uh, is the presence of the elk rut where all the deer species have a rut in which the males try to attract females and then mate with them. So I start with this photograph taken in Colorado and you can see the elk in the bottom right hand corner and it's adorned its antlers with vegetation as it comes into its group of what is that, something like eight uh, females and it's going to try and look after those males, uh, those females and mate with them. But on the left hand side of the screen, you can see this beautiful aspen tree caught in the colours. So it is this juxtaposition of the autumnal colours with the rut. 
And this was a photograph I took just a couple of hours ago from my study, uh, from my study, just looking at the colors that we have uh, just from my own house, looking back up into the hill. And you can see those vibrant uh, yellows, just remarkable when the sun hits those and the oranges, the reds, and of course, some trees still green. And while I don't have elk on my property, I do have a herd of white-tailed deer. And as far as I'm concerned, these are my white-tailed deer. So this is a group of nine individuals that I see many times a day. Last night, they were at the front of the house and I walked past them within a meter of two. And they stand and look at you like this as you walk past. And then uh, this morning, they were at the very uh, back door. So when I went to let the dogs out this morning, they were all standing there eating our garden and they just moved on again. And I adore these deer because I follow them day by deer. I find where they drop their fawns and then I follow them. And, I, and we're coming into the rut of the white-tailed deer just now. They're much smaller than the elk species, so their rut is later because their gestation period is significantly later. But I'm gonna talk about what happens with the big ones and particularly the elk. I want to start by just pointing out that there are two dominant species. There are four species altogether in this group, but the two dominant species are the one in Western Europe, which of course are the red deer, the Western red deer. And uh, my native homeland indeed is the Highlands of Scotland. And at this time of year, I would be surprised if I didn't hear deer roaring from my bedroom window early in the morning. But I'm gonna talk about the elk, or sometimes called the wapiti, that occur both in Asia and in North America. Now that word wapiti is a very interesting word because it's actually a Native American word that came that is derived from the term for white and it's to do with the colors that you see on their bottoms as they run away. Now they originated from Asia some 25 million years ago and that stage the Bering Straits were coupled so the deer could actually move across from Asia and invade into North America. And as you can see, the light green shows you the distribution that they had at that um, uh, originally. So they were found throughout what is now the United States and of course through many parts of Canada and down into Mexico. They've been hunted hard and restricted. So now the population is primarily through the Rocky Mountains. So if you really want to go and see them, you should go to the Rocky Mountains. Those are the places where you'll see much of the behavior and the excitement. And I go to three places. Naturally, I go to Yellowstone National Park. And as if you've listened to me talk before, you'll know that I work there and I undertake research there. So this is an obvious place for me to go and photograph them. I've also gone to the Rocky Mountain National Park, and the difference between these two is the wolves are not present in the Rocky Mountain National Park. And so they're more relaxed, they're easier to approach, and you can see them in, in, in almost all habitats there. In Yellowstone, they are pushed out of many of the habitats because they're trying to avoid the wolves. So you have this tension between the elk and the wolves. But I'm also very fortunate because I live in central Pennsylvania. And I live an hour and a half south of Elk County where elk were reintroduced back into the area back in 1913. And then they spread throughout the population and then they've been restricted. So there are areas up there where you can see them, photograph them and uh, watch their behavior. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm going to talk about the behavior of the elk and in particular the bulls. In Scotland, we call them stags and hinds and here they call them bulls and cows. And it is this remarkable bugling sound that uh, attracts you immediately and their behavior all the time while they're doing these calls to each other. You can see interactions, and if you're a photographer, you'll, be, you'll notice that this was taken on a very slow shutter speed, taken specifically because the elk cow, the elk bull on the left 
is thrashing at the vegetation and the one on the right is scooping up the water and I wanted to try and capture the movement of the interactions there. So I'm going to talk about what I call the secondary sexual characteristics. That is the fact that the elk bulls have these huge antlers out there. Secondly, they bugle all the time. And thirdly, they have these remarkable behaviors where they fight each other for females, they're trying to scare each other off, and they're trying to attract females into their groups. So let's start with the antlers. And the antlers, if you just stop and think for a minute, are a remarkable thing. These great big, huge pieces of bone that they grow each year that sit on their heads. What an incredible energy expenditure that is. So here is a bull in his prime. You'll see how thick those antlers are. And you'll notice that they're just slightly thicker at the top than at the bottom. And that tells me that this is an individual probably eight, 10, or maybe even 11 years old, because once he gets to 12 years old, so the antlers start going back. So the antlers get thinner higher up and they get thicker lower down. So this is a typical elk that is going to be winning females and mating with the females. They don't have, they can't win females when they're young and they can't win females when they're old. So there is a prime period in which they compete really hard. And that is usually when they're eight to 10 years of age. Here in comparison is a four-year-old stag. And you can see that he has the same number of tines as that last individual. You can still count six tines on each side of his antler, but the antlers are thinner. He doesn't have the body mass and he's probably a four year old. So next year or the year afterwards, he's going to start really fighting amongst the other males to try and get access to the females. They keep these antlers throughout most of the year and they certainly carry them during the winter period. And this is an interesting thing altogether because the mating season is really only three weeks. And after that period, they still carry around this, this hat rack, this enormous weight, which can be 20 kilograms on their head balanced above them. And they have to carry on eating and of course do it, carry them. And this makes us believe that they're really there as a weapon to be used in defense during the winter months. They drop them in April, and then in May and June, they start growing them all over again. And this was a photograph I took in Yellowstone, and it's a photograph I think it's taken at dawn rather than dusk, as the sun is coming up, and this male was running up the side of this hill. And you can see his antlers are only just starting to grow. At this stage, the antlers are covered by velvet. They're covered by this skin which moves the blood into, that, into the antlers and deposits calcium. Now, remember these antlers are equivalent to bone. They're not like horns that you would see on sheep and goats. Those are made of keratin and they don't shed those. Antlers are made of bone and they grow them every year. And they will grow them at about 1.75 centimeters a day until they come to be about 150 centimeters long. So that the expanse is something like two meters in width and they can weigh up to nine kilograms each. Just remarkable. And the males do this in a period of just 140 days where they take the new grass, extract the calcium, and then pump it back into those antlers. Really, really quite a remarkable physiological uh, ability. And it is a demonstration to other males, as well as to, other as well as to the females, about how strong and fit they are and how suitable they are to be the fathers of the offspring. Because if they're the fathers of the offspring, it's saying your offspring will also be as handsome and good looking as I am. 
Here is a two-year-old, and you can see this is a two-year-old that is, is shedding the velvet. You can see on the antlers at the end the remains of the skin, and this individual has probably been rubbing its horns against the antlers. In Scotland, we sometimes call them horns. In the antlers, they've been rubbing them against the vegetation to get that skin all off. I know it's not a one-year-old, because if it was a one-year-old, it would have a spike it just there. You would just see one simple spike with no, with no um, tines at the end. This time, they're actually starting. So I think this is a two-year-old, and as I said, probably in early September. Here's a three-year-old where they're starting to grow up, and this was taken, this was taken in the snows in, probably in January or February, in Yellowstone and I was stalking it from below and was able to take a shot looking up into its face and it's looking down at me. So the antlers consist of a series of tines, those are the points and it's considered a tine, certainly in Scotland where I come from, if it's big enough to hang your hat on. If you can't hang your hat on it, you can't count it. With elk in America, we count them the number of times on each side. So this is a six by six. And it's um, they reach that, as I said, when they're about four years of age. In Scotland, we would call this a royal because in Scotland, the quality of the vegetation is so much worse than it is in Yellowstone or, or in the Rocky Mountain National Park. And so it's exceptional to see an individual of this sort of quality but it is not uncommon in Colorado. Sometimes in Scotland, we have them seven on each side and then we call that an imperial. We call that a 14 pointer, but you can have up to eight, but usually you see them with, with six on each side, a 12 pointer. Occasionally individuals have accidents when they're fighting. And I think if you look on the right eye, it looks as though this individual was in a fight and it's actually damaged its eye. Now, looking at the remaining antler, it has, it is, this is a pretty uh, healthy individual, but he suffered this accident, and as a consequence of that accident, got damaged, and this individual could really, uh, won't have access to females at all. Any male with a full set of antlers can see him off. So he's finished for the year. About 20% of the males of this age group will get damaged during these fighting. And of course, if there are predators, particularly wolves or what, they will be able to pick those individuals off quite easily. Now, this is an engraving by Edward Landseer, and it's called a stag at bay. It's a very famous uh, engraving, Scottish engraving, and I've included this for the very simple reason that this used to hang in my house in Scotland. And the, uh, this tells you about the behavior of the deer when they're being chased by predators. When they're being chased by wolves, the males in particular will go to water. That's why we call it going to bay, because they're going to the water, they stand in the water, and they use the depth of the water as part of the reason to try and keep the predators away. But of course, the antlers, if you ever watch an elk being, uh, being attacked by wolves, you will see that they use their antlers a lot to try and damage the, uh, to, to damage the wolves. So we see antlers very much devolved as weapons to be used against other bulls and predators and not so much a sexual signal. So the antlers are there to win, beat the other males, but they're not really, the females, we don't think, are really looking at the uh, sexual signal there. We think what they're doing is just comparing the different bulls and saying, well, that bull over there is more attractive than this one, so I'm going to go over there because I want to have a sexy son as well. So let's move on now, and let's talk about the bugle. In Scotland, the red deer roar. And it's this deep, deep roar. In America, the elk bugle. And I want you to listen to a bugle call. I hope you can hear it. Oh. 
Now, there are three components to that bugle. There's the on glide, which has the deep resonance, followed by the whistle, and then finishing again with a series of grunts. Here's the on glide. That's the whistle. And listen, that's the off glide and the series of grunts. And what they're telling you is different things. So the first one, the on glide, is basically saying, beware, I am here and I'm looking for females. The second one is really says, is a signal to say, you know, if you come too close, I might have to fight you because I'm worried you're gonna take my cows. And what's more, if you've got cows, I'm gonna take those. And then the third one is the, is, uh, tells you about his body size. And that's the grunting. So here we go again, the on glide, I'm here, whistle, keep away. And then the other bull can work out how big it is by the call at the end. And it's very interesting that red deer have the same sort of grunts there at the end. So what this means is that when you're in the field and you're stalking, and um, this has happened to me many times over the last two weeks, I come up, I, say, I hear an elk bugling, I get in close to it, trying to take a photograph, and then you hear the whole thing going on. It's not just one, but multiple. Multiple elk calling backwards and forwards. This cacophony of calls is remarkable. And I find it really interesting because I immediately go, oh gosh, there's one over there. There's one over there. I can hear one back there. And if I can't get close to these, I'm gonna stalk around and see if I can look at one of the others. And my preference always is to try and get the elk doing something. The last thing I want to do is get a photograph of an elk with their head down grazing. I want to get them in some form of sexual behavior. And you know, obviously the bugling is a great thing to photograph. One of the other things that elk and red deer do is they do this wallowing where they go to muddy areas and roll in the mud. They urinate in that mud and they get the smell on them and they urinate on themselves to make, to, I suppose, demonstrate to the females that they're here and they're ready to mate. And you will often see them covered in mud after they've been into these places. They will sometimes go in there and they will thrash about. And in this image, I've done a very slow shutter speed of a 15th of a second to try and capture those actions of the elk as it's rushing, as it's wallowing away in that area before they emerge. And uh, I also like to get them when they come down to streams or water. And I really like this sort of backlit approach. And I'm a close friend and colleague of Andy Rouse. And this is something that Andy has uh, really done very well, capturing photographs of animals in these sort of backlit situations. The other thing they will do is they thrash. They thrash into the vegetation. And I think they may be depositing some scent as they're doing this, but it's also part of the testosterone. Their testosterone levels are just buzzing. They're not interested in eating. They might lose 20% of their weight during the rut, but they are just testosterone bulls, ready to fight, ready to fight anything or anyone. And of course, what they're after is looking after those females, is bringing those females together and taking care of them such that when the females come into season, come into estrus, then they can take the opportunity of mating with them. They know when the females are in estrus by their scent. So in many of my photographs, you'll see the elk are sitting there with a tongue out. And it's not a comment to me, it's, a, it's what they're doing is they're scenting the air. They're trying to capture the scent of a female in estrus. And once they can do that, and of course they go round and sniff the rear ends of the females as well, but once they find that, then they, they will of course mate with them. So time and time again, 
you see the bulls with their females, with their tongues out, going round, sniffing the females, checking her out. And she's, she also gives him messages and says whether she is available or not. And then they will, uh, when the situation is right, they will copulate. This sort of picture is not unusual in that it's not unusual for there to be other bulls standing around. The younger bulls and the less successful bulls are watching the herd all the time. And they're doing this for a couple of reasons. And one of those, of course, is if that, if that male bull is injured, they will move straight in and try and take over the herd and try and make with the females if they can. So if they see an opportunity where he fails in any way, then they take advantage of it. Quite often that ha what happens during the rut is the male becomes so weakened that one of these secondary males can come in and push him off and then might get two or three matings at the tail end of the season, depending on how exhausted the male is. The females also become aggressive and sometimes they will even, uh, they, you know, the, the smell of the scent will have them doing false copulations as well. But these secondary males are a nuisance. And of course, they're always pushing the main male. So the main male is trying to chase them away. And once again, this is a slow shutter speed to try and capture the movement of the elk as they run away from each other. These males, they will just sit and watch all the time. And this is a classic young male, probably a six-year-old, just waiting for his opportunity to come in and move in on the herd. This is yet another one. Quite, a, you know, almost ready for mating, almost ready to take on his own herd. And you can see that his, his antlers really aren't quite big enough yet to be able to uh, compete with some of those big males. In red deer, we have a very interesting situation, and I can find no evidence that this takes place in elk in North America. But during the, mate, during the mating season, some males do not grow antlers at all, and we call those hummels. And those males will mix with the female and undertake what we call kleptogamy, which is, uh, in science, is called a sneaky, I'm not sure what that second word is, but these, in, and that is used in science, so this is not a term I've developed, it's a recognized term in science, that those males that don't have antlers, the beta males, can sometimes mix with the females, the male doesn't recognize it as a male, and when the alpha male is not looking, can actually sneak in a copulation, and, there is, and this happens both in uh, red deer and it also happens with elephant seals and another of other animals. So this is a different strategy. If you're a weak male, try and be a sneaky rather than, uh, rather than defend the males, the females. So let's move on to the fighting. And you, you often meet people who say, oh, I saw some elk fighting today. What they usually mean is they've seen some sparring take place. And this is a casual engagement where two young males come together and they uh, will be testing each other. And this is a practice, a play. This is also trying to work out the hierarchy amongst themselves about who is the dominant bull in such a situation. But when you watch them, this is always done carefully. They don't want to injure each other. They just want to see how good the other individual is, is. And then one of those will get pushed off or may move off to another herd to look for another area where they can try another herd to look at. As I said earlier, the dominant male gets upset by these individuals and he will chase those away. But sometimes they come to real blows. And this is just a fantastic thing to see. And when they do come to blows, they have a ritual they go through. So many deer, and you will see this in many animal species, do what we call the parallel walk. This is where the two individuals walk next to each other and they're just calling and looking at each other. They're assessing their body size and without actually coming into contact. And they're saying, 
am I prepared to risk injury by fighting with this individual? And if the individual is big and strong and dominant, you might decide to save yourself for another day. But if he's an individual that you think you can beat, then they start coming together. So here's a series of photographs that I took in Rocky Mountain National Park. Two big elk bulls and they're in parallel walk. They must have walked for, well, easily half a kilometer next to each other. They look as though they're just going out to do some shopping because they're just walking slowly next to each other. And then they turn around and they start look, assessing each other and they'll start putting their horns together before the fight actually starts. And then they start pushing against each other. And then the competition, the fight really starts. And this is extremely exciting to watch. And if you've got a camera where you're taking 14, 20 photographs a second, I can assure you a fight like this, you will burn through hundreds and hundreds of photographs in a very rapid succession. I always find it very interesting that when males like this are indeed fighting, they do everything they can to keep their, their bottoms and their testicles hidden so that they don't get damaged during this sort of fight. And you, you can see this in many species from zebra right the way through to the elk. What I really like to get in these fights is to try and get capture the dust as the, and the energy of the fight as the two come together. And you can see the one on the right is really putting its whole power into pushing that individual. And that's what it's just trying to do. It's just trying to show its strength by pushing that individual back. They will break during these times and then sometimes come back together with a clash and look at those eyes. Isn't it amazing how the eyes pop out there? And you see that you see there's a, a cow in the bottom left hand corner and the females are watching what's going on. And sometimes will actually leave one herd and go and join the herd of the other elk that they think is the more attractive individual to make with. This fight can go on. I've seen them go on for at least 20 minutes until one finally gives up and runs away. At that stage, the male tries to herd in the other one's cows. Not all of them will come. Some of them might be quite happy to stay with the male that's run away, but to try and increase the size of his herd. But it's difficult to hold together more than 10 hinds, really. Quite a lot of the um, herds are, just have eight, eight hinds. So let's talk a little bit about photographing elk. And I'm grateful to my wonderful daughter, Kitty McCulgren, for taking this photograph. And we were out photographing together. And when she showed me her photographs, I realized she'd been taking photographs of me. So I'm very grateful to the, for you, Kitty, taking that photograph. This is one of my favorite photographs. And this was taken in Rocky Mountain soon after Kitty took that photograph of me. And I was positioning myself to get the sun behind me. But one thing you should always do during photography is to look behind you. And I was photographing these two elk uh, that were bugling. And I turned around behind me and this male came up the hill, stood on the top of the hill and then breathed in the in the crisp air. And you could see the you could see the the air coming out of its nostrils. And uh, that was just a wonderful opportunity for me. I actually used this photograph and submitted it to a competition with the Royal Photographic Society. And when the judges looked at it, they agreed that I had cheated. They thought I had actually added this breath using Photoshop to try and get that effect. And I can assure you, I never did anything of the sort. It was just, uh, they were just totally wrong about this. But anyway, I love this photograph and I love the backlit situation. You must be careful when you're stalking, of course, because elk can be watching you and they can be and you can. And it's part of the enjoyment to me is to be able to use the vegetation. And we do this a lot in Scotland. We will stalk for for miles in deep boggy areas to get into a position to get a really nice photograph. The elk are watching for people as well as other elk, so they're very alert. 
And it's, uh, it is a great technique to be able to stalk upwind and be able to take great photographs. But when you're in thick wooded vegetation, you have to watch out where they are and what's going on so you don't alert them. There again, if you're in a place like um, this Rocky Mountain here, then you, the elk will come down and they will cross the road and they can be really close to the road when you're taking those shots. And I don't think those people are taking photographs of me. I think they were interested in taking photographs of the elk. What they do in these places, of course, is that they will close off areas such that, uh, and that's Western Bluebird sitting on top of this sign, by the way, they will, uh, they will close off areas during the rut so people can't enter those areas and disturb it. So you may be restricted to the road and areas next to the road when you're actually watching it. But as I said, you do get great opportunities, particularly in Rocky Mountain, to do this. In Yellowstone, uh, and the main town in Yellowstone is called Mammoth, and that's where the headquarters of the Yellowstone National Park is. The elk move into the town, and this happens in many towns, and they're doing this to avoid the wolves. The wolves will not come into the town, so the males come in, the elk uh, cows come in, and the males come in, and they will fight. But this is an extremely dangerous time because the males are full of testosterone, and they will attack cars, as well as people. And several people are gored, and I've seen vehicles when an elk attacks it, just bashing the side out of a vehicle. So this is a very silly woman that's waving to an elk, to a male elk that's full of testosterone. And you really should be extremely careful about the elk at this time of year. One of the things I really adore doing is trying to take photographs of elk at very first light, trying to catch that first light as it hits the side of the elk. And so I will have waited at dawn, seen the elk moving pre-dawn, worked out where the sun's going to come to try and capture them as they do, as they move into the, into the light. And this one, you can see there's a, a bull down here, but the light is also capturing the uh, trees up there. And I like the fact that it's, it's the elk, it's dark, and then it's the elk, I, uh, the light on the trees. I like those sort of patterns that emerge. Of course, it's great when they, when they bugle as well. And in this sort of grassy habitat. I think it looks, um, I think it brings out the elk and the behavior you're looking at. This is a photograph I took just a couple of days ago and I was watching this elk in the forest and it was uh, up in Elk County, very dark. And just as first light came out, he came out and bugle and the light just caught the side of the antlers as he did that. It's not quite, I would have liked a bit more light on his face so you could see it just a bit more clearly. But I like the way the light catches the tines. And what a fantastic set of antlers this guy had. And I think you should also focus on the components. And, you know, I like the fact that you can take a photograph just of the antlers in the grass, or you can get really up close with individuals. Um, ignore the antlers, but try and get the expression in the face and get a really tight, detailed shot of it. Here in Elk County, one of the things I really like is when we have a very misty morning taking place and we can I can try and get shots. And once again, here I am trying to keep as low as I can to keep the outline of the elk against the mist or to take photographs as he's bugling and coming out of the mist. And you can see the, um, you can see the frost on the grass there. So this is... This is like, uh, this is obviously below freezing temperature at this moment. And that's why we're just getting the first light, and just getting the, the mist raising. You'll sometimes see him chasing his, uh, his cows around and getting to come towards you. But it's, it's not, I really want to bring out the idea of the mist. So one of my friends, a really good photographer that I listened to very carefully, suggested that what I try is try and do some sepia prints and to convert those into black and white and to put a sepia wash 
and then to get to try and bring out that ethos. And I, I like that suggestion of hers, and I think she's done it. I think that was that works quite well on this. Of course, straight black and white photographs are always enjoyable because they bring out the texture of the animal's uh, coat. And particularly these males, when they've been wallowing and urinating on themselves, they have some really deep textures to go in their coat. So uh, I've given you a quick tour de force of these wonderful creatures. And if you were in the Northern Hemisphere in temperate zones at the moment, I hope you would be out and enjoying yourself. This is a photograph of some uh, hinds, some cows uh, in Yellowstone, just as they're starting to, uh, just as the sun is setting. So thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed that. If you have any species or anything you would like to see us talking about on Paul's Trails, please drop us a note and tell us what you think. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, PD. Definitely, you know, you, you talking with you is like uh, sitting in class. That's what I uh, that that's what's the feel for me. You kind of that too for me. Sitting in the class is not <laughs> always that keen, but when it comes to your class, definitely, yeah, it's, it's such as it, uh, your classes are such a source of information, full of energy, and the subject which I love. So thank you on behalf of me and on behalf of all the audience. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That's very, very kind of you. I hate the idea of you sitting in class, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But then there is there are two type of students, you know, depending on the subject and depending on the interest in the subject. So I'm definitely in this particular class, the first venture. <laughs> <laughs> no, the good thing is uh, you explain it so well that people sit and listen to you. Yeah. What any teacher or any mentor has to uh, create. What we want to do, of course, is to inspire people to take photographs and to appreciate nature. Yeah. And, yes. you know, I, um, in the middle of this pandemic and, the mid and some reports we've seen recently, wildlife is in a dreadful, dreadful situation. Yes. I, I, I can hardly, I am so upset by the way the situation is at the moment, I can hardly, I get, so, for example, I can't watch David Attenborough's new film, which is about what we have to do to save the planet. I just find it so upsetting that we're in this situation because I became enthralled by conservation when I was 13 years old. And I can remember buying uh, a copy of the BBC Wildlife magazine, which was on conservation at that time and thinking, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And it just makes me so sad that... Now, 55 years later, we're still in this dreadful situation. It's got worse. Yeah. It's awful. And I, that's why we, every one of us, and I, you know, I really respect you two because of what you're doing and dedicating your life to Paul's Trails and to conservation action, but we all have to do everything we can. And photography is one way of doing it, increasing awareness. And I hope through these talks, we're really hoping to reach to people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole intention. Like, a lot of people do ask us, how do you guys, I mean, what's the reason behind uh, post race? Do you get enough money to survive? All these questions do pop up every now and then. Everyone, you know, most of the people are only keen on uh, on the money part. But yeah, there. I'm not saying that money is not important, but there are certain things which gives a value to you or to you, your life beyond money at times you know that you, life may not be easy but then that definitely gives you the happiness of doing something good without expecting anything anything so can, a positive thing yes i can't tell you how much this white tailed deer herd gives me happiness and uh, yesterday evening as it was getting dark and i was walking out uh, in the woods and they were they were stand there were nine of them standing there and we had an interaction they knew i was there i knew they were there we looked at each other and i kept walking and that that connection is just magical and you know that and you get that when you're looking at elk when you're looking at any animal you get this connection and I have this connection, or I'm trying to develop this connection with a black bear at the moment, you know, I've talked about him before. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, 
I respect him, respect that this is his environment and we, uh, and I'm not threatening him. And I've taught my dogs that they must, um, they, as soon as they see the deer, they must come and stand behind me. So this morning when we opened the door to let the dogs out so they could go and urinate and do what dogs do first thing in the morning, they stopped and said, we can't go out. And when I looked, there were the white-tailed deer, literally just in front of the back. And I just, and I go, Fair, absolutely right. Sorry, dear, to disturb you. Close the door. You have to hold your bladders till they've moved on. Oh, my God. <laughs> you need to make some alternative arrangements <laughs> for the dog, too. <laughs> yeah but you know that's something which people don't understand you know that, that connection is what we are trying to talk about that connection is what we are trying to establish at least in the upcoming generation uh, in the among the kids and you know at, at whatever stage of life you are in you still have room to do something it can be extremely simple things like yes you know extremely extremely simple things like carrying a water bottle and uh, uh, reducing single use plastic at least changing yourself one once a week uh, being a vegetarian and everything makes a lot of difference when you're doing it collectively yeah but then it should start from one person and yes. it can then spread into your family from into your friends and into your social circle so that's the only way to change. If we all are going to think it is not possible, uh, one, may not, one man cannot make a difference. That's, I think, the wrong way. Whatever impact it's going to make, even if it is a point, zero, point, 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 still, still, I think we all should do our part of, you know, responsibility to make this place to a better place. And, uh, you know, we're in a dreadful time in the United States at the moment because we're coming up to an election in just a couple of weeks and uh, the politics is really ghastly. It's really absolutely dreadful. I can't tell you how awful it is. But the important thing is that if you're an environmentalist, you must use your vote for environmental awareness. And you should be having that at the very top of what, you know, the policies are you're interested in. Forget some of the other ones. Say, I'm voting for an environmental reason and I'm voting for these candidates because they support that. Yeah, that's that. I Unfortunately, that is the situation across the world. In most of the places, you, you know, money rules. And uh, in most of the places, everybody is only keen about um, uh, money and uh, people who are in power and in business hardly care about uh, nature i'm not saying every business team is like that there are there are companies who give definitely good values for csr activities and protection of nature but then the majority play on the negative side which is very sad so you have to you have to think about this pandemic for one minute this pandemic is an environmental issue. It is because of habitat destruction that we're, these viruses are coming into the human population. We have to stop habitat destruction. Now, if you look at this financially, this has cost tens of trillions of dollars. And the global, the, the, you know, the, the global economy has suffered more from this than anything else. So if you do more, so you should look at the cost of this and the benefit is to put the habitat right and to not destroy this habitat to go and plant a tree haha <laughs> true i mean it, it simple simple things that's what we were all i mean when when we start think about it you know when i or in when we collectively thought about what can we do every person can do on a with the minimum effort on a personal base I, we couldn't find anything better than this. This has been done for ages. This is There are still people from across the world doing under different names. But if we can add a little more green to nature, why not? I also, if we this in 10 days' time, I think we almost planted 100 trees. Yeah. So, and this is something that photographers have done. So as you know, Salgado, one of the most incredible environmental photographers, what he's done back in his native land is bought land that has been destroyed 
and plants trees, get his, his whole family and the villagers and the people plant trees to get the tropical rainforest back. And uh, I take my hat off to him both for, the, for his breathtaking images and his actions. Really remarkable. I think in even um, I, I I'm sorry I forgot the name of the person. There are a couple of especially there was an article about a, a couple in India uh, who have done the same thing. A bare land they bought and uh, it I think after I think years. How they, I'm sorry. They converted it into a forest. Right? They converted it into, it into a forest. In uh, so they there are images which shows how bad condition it was in when they bought the land and how they changed it to a different, a completely different uh, scenario. So that those are the things which people should do and people should value, you know, at least to, you know, forget destroying is happening around the world at every nook and corner, but whatever little bit we can do, that is definitely something which we need to do at this point of time. So, we, we have a, please go ahead, Hermes, sorry. Uh, sorry, we have a question from Ellie on the elk. Are the elks move in the same territories of the wolves mentioned last time? And how hard to witness their interaction? So, um, so, in yet, so at the moment, the wolf population has been reintroduced into America. And there is this tongue of wolves that have come down here through Montana and Wyoming. And so when you're in Yellowstone, you will see wolves. And in the past, interactions were not uncommon. So, you know, you would see interactions if you were there for a week. Now the elk have moved away and those interactions are much, much rarer to actually see. And, it's, and you know, uh, Nietzsche and I were there in Yellowstone for a week uh, at the beginning of January. And we saw, I don't think we saw any hunting, did we, Nisha? I think, they, oh yes, we saw one that had made a kill, that one pack, you know, with the, with the white female and alpha female, and then the others had made a kill, but we didn't see them hunting. When you come further south, wolves haven't yet reached those areas, but it's an interesting situation in Colorado at the moment because they have a ballot to decide whether they're going to reintroduce wolves into this area of the Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, I, I suspect the answer may be no, and the argument is this will give a balance back to the nature. But I suspect, but the wolves are really not far away. We've already seen wolves reaching down into Rocky Mountain National Park. And I can show you movement of wolves that we've done from radio tags, and the habitat is there, they will move. So it's only a matter of time before they move down. I am stunned at how well wolves can invade areas, how they can hide away and form little packs without you ever knowing about it. So, uh, you know, there are parts of the, the Alps that I've been to and the Italian Alps where we didn't think there were any wolves at all. And then we can't start finding signs. And then we find these wolves are living really very close to where humans are, but they're able to keep themselves quiet. And I think once they're established, it's almost impossible to kill those wolves off totally unless you use poisons. And that's why we that's why humans succeeded in the past, because of the misuse of poisons. And I think and I think that will um, I think, you know, that I hope society is such now that we would not use poisons ever to kill any form of wildlife. That's very sad, yeah. But yeah, we we, all, we can only think about humans in most of the case. Yeah. Uh, Shaista message. Thank you, Dr. Peter. You. I have photographed these beauties in Scotland, but had no clue about their behavior. I'll now try to, uh, I'll now try and listen to the sounds they make. Very informative. Good. That is what a great webinar. And Scottish red deer are indeed the best. A <laughs> <laughs> very <laughs> Scottish heart. <laughs> So this isn't actually true. When you look at the Scottish red deer, their males are often very weak and their antlers are not as impressive as you see. But the Duke of Edinburgh 
um, I was talking to him about this once, and he had taken a group of red deer from Scotland, from Balmoral Estate, and introduced them into Windsor National Park. And within a year, they were growing the most spectacular heads. And it's quite simply because of the nutrition. So the nutrition and their ability to get that nutrition, to build these huge, huge antlers is just incredible. It's just physiological, remarkable. Like growing a couple of legs on the top of your head every year and then <laughs> off. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So yeah, let's... That's, all, that's all for now we have. Great. So we're back in two weeks and we will be talking about the PT Aware magazine, I think. Is yes. That so yeah. that, that's well, again well, a well, gentle well, reminder for sending the uh, Indian elephants pictures if you have. If you haven't registered at Postrave's website, please do register, then click on login. And once you log in, click on contribute. You get a form. You have an option to share your images. If you have stories, you have an option to share your stories for different sections. So all you need to do is register, log in, click on contribute, select the section which you would like to contribute the images. And it's all free. And it's uh, the whole idea as PT start to uh, you know, PT mentioned while he started the conversation, it's all uh, about sharing the images for a good cause to connect people with nature. And it's all about community photography. So that's the reason we are sitting in different part of the world. Hermes is in Dubai, I'm in Vancouver, PT is in the US. So we are trying to do one thing using the image and using the knowledge what we share to connect with people and to do our best to do something positive for protecting our mother nature. Yeah. So elephant images, please don't forget. And if you are planting, please try to plant native saplings, whichever, if it at least one to begin with and take care of it. And please do send a one minute video or an image whenever you are planting one to echoconnectors at gmail.com. Plant things to feed your elephants. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. See you next Saturday. Yeah. Please do yeah. take care. It's uh, okay. keep bye, the bye. distancing and everything possible to bye. keep bye. COVID away. <laughs>